You're listening to the CD Baby. CD Baby. CD Baby DIY Musician Hey there, and welcome to episode number 59 of the CD Baby DIY Musician Podcast. My name is Kevin Bruner, your host for the show, and this time around, you're going to hear from Nancy Bain. Well, Nancy is an associate professor in communication studies at the University of Kansas, where she teaches on topics such as the use of new communication technologies and creating identities, relationships, and communities. She also has a blog called Online Fandom, where she takes a deeper look at fan communities, especially online fan communities. As indie artists, we spend a lot of time talking about ourselves and trying to get other people interested in our music, but we could probably improve our communication skills if we spent a little less time talking and more time listening to our audience. In my interview with Nancy, we look at music and music promotion from the fans' perspective, so let's get to that interview. Well, Nancy, thanks for being on the podcast pleasure. I've been uh, reading your blog for a while and I think it's uh, an interesting perspective that you present as you really take a look at things from the fans point of view where our audience for the podcast is artists and musicians who really are trying to create fans but many times don't consider their perspective at all. Um, Before we get into the details of your study on fandom uh, can you give us a little bit about your background and how you got into this in the first place? Sure well okay so I'm a diehard longtime music fan, you know, like slept with the transistor radio under my pillow listening to (laughs) WLS Chicago when I was 12 years old, just waiting for them to play I Want You to Want Me. Um, And I worked in a record store when I was in graduate school. I've, you know, traveled all over the place following my favorite band. So I am a diehard music fan. And in a lot of ways, that's where I start from. Um, As a scholar, Um, I got really interested in the internet and fan activity, although I didn't start by looking at music fandom. In a way, I feel like I started looking at online fandom in 1991, and in a lot of ways, I think that music fandom wasn't really anywhere near as interesting at that time as it's become. Mm -hmm. Um, So I was looking at TV fans. Um, And then in the last few years, I've gotten back to looking at fandom in the context of music and kind of bringing those things all together. I'm in communication, so my background academically is in interpersonal communication and personal relationships and how that all plays out on the internet. Well, just from what you mentioned there, being a young girl waiting for the radio to to play that song, you've been researching this a long time. How do you think it's changed from that, you know, being a fan from the perspective of waiting for the song on the radio to now on the internet where you have everything at your fingertips. Everything you want the minute you want it. Well, you know, I mean, I kind of have a little bit of mixed feelings about it because on the one hand, I think it's incredibly powerful and wonderful that we can get the music we want when we want it. And I really can't argue with that. But at the same time, it does detract a little bit from how totally special it was when that song finally came on. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I remember sitting there with my uh, my little mono tape recorder held next to the radio, <laughs> waiting, hoping, hoping it would come. And, you know, I had like, I missed the first two seconds of all the songs I taped. But, but you know, certainly the ability to just create your playlist on Last FM now, who can really argue with that? Mm-hmm. It's a great time to be a music fan. What are fans getting out of fandom? What are they, what, what drives them to, uh, to want to obsess over artists like this? Okay, well, I mean, I think the point is that they're obsessing already. And so then fandom gives them a way, an outlet for that obsession. Mm -hmm. Because I think when you're obsessing, you want to talk about it, and you want to hear what other people think, and you don't want to miss any piece of information that's out there, and you want to be with people who understand. You know, it's very Mm -hmm. frustrating when you're walking around totally into a song or an album or a band and and I don't know about other fans but I tend to sort of feel like you know oh what's all this real world doing it's in my way I just want to listen to the music you know Mm -hmm. and so then to have other people who get it is so powerfully important and I think that 
a lot of what fans are getting is is just that communal experience of sharing that obsession and and not being alone in it and and talking to somebody who who really understands what it means to you um, and having that validation of your own emotional experience. Mm -hmm. Another huge piece of it is... um, is information seeking. You know, are there songs that I don't know about? Have they done covers that I'm not aware of? Um, are there bootlegs out there that I should have? Um, can you give me that bootleg? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Will you upload it to, to whatever file sharing program so I can get it? Um, that kind of information sharing and building discographies, finding finding everything they ever did, every show they ever played, knowing the set lists, that kind of really nerdy, geeky information collection requires other people. Mm-hmm. Well, that, I think that's something interesting that uh, you're pointing out there that I think a lot of indie artists uh, just don't even think about is the fact that it's fans also building community with each other as opposed to just building a relationship with the artists themselves. Yeah, absolutely. It's. I mean, it is. It. I think from the artist's point of view, it, it is important that they build relationships with the fans, but I think it's also really important that they foster the fans' relationships with one another. And another side of that, from the, from the artist's point of view, is if the fans are connected to each other and they're committed to being part of the fandom, they're going to go to your shows and buy your music just so that they can keep up with their friends. <laughs> right? Like when I studied soap operas, people would say, I don't even watch the soap anymore, but I, but I still pay attention to it sometimes because otherwise I can't participate in these discussions. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've certainly bought albums by bands I had lost interest in just because I wanted to be able to um, understand what other people were saying about the record. Mm-hmm. Do you have any specific examples of how like an indie artist could take some steps into fostering that relationship between their, the, their community of fans as opposed to just trying to send out one-way communication towards them? Well, I think um, when I spoke at Madame, one of the things I talked about was encouraging their creativity and whether that's letting them do remixes or letting them come up with ideas for album arts and T-shirts. I think that anything that encourages fans to share the um, their own creative ideas with one another builds community. I think that... Um, letting them have their own fan pages and their own forums or letting them have whatever conversations on your forum you want if you are have a forum on your own site, recognizing that message control is not everything, mm-hmm. that it's important that people be allowed to talk about things that you don't want to talk to is important. I think that giving people um, tools to spread your music is important, um, whether that's ev- even just sort of links to streams or playlists you've put together because fans want to s- share information with each other. So if you, not everybody's going to be going to your website all the time, right? But if they mm-hmm. go to your website and there's a widget and they can take that widget and put it on their own site or they can Twitter something. So g- putting out bits of information that people can grab onto and spread around gives them a way to build those connections to each other. Uh, speaking of spreading uh, things around uh, and getting the music out there, there's been a growing debate uh, amongst indie artists, and we get this asked this question a lot here at CD Baby about giving away free music. And um, in your uh, presentation that you gave at Madame, you mm-hmm. there was a quote from that where you said, "When we focus on fear and control, we lose sight of the big picture, and that is music is social." Do you think that? Uh, Artists are really getting hung up on the idea now that the internet is wide open, getting hung up on the idea that I don't have control anymore and and, uh, this is a problem for me. I don't think that they articulate it that way. Mm -hmm. um, But I think that what happens for a lot of artists is feeling like, "Uh uh-oh, they're doing something with it I don't want them to do. I need to make them stop. Mm Mm-hmm. Right, and whether that's the RIA suing or if it's the artist suing to get their domain name back because they don't like what you're saying about them, or um, DRM. I mean, there's a million ways in which this plays out to try to constrain what your fans do online. Um, so I don't think that that artists, especially indie artists, are sitting around saying, "Oh no, I need to reexert control because in these contemporary times the technology has rendered me powerless." Mm-hmm. Um, but I think that they're act, frequently acting out of that sense. I think indie artists are a lot better about this than not indie artists mm-hmm. because they recognize are much more likely to recognize that um, 
the word of mouth that goes around from fans is a really, really powerful resource for them. Well, another quote from uh, that little section of your presentation that I really liked was uh, that you mentioned, if we feel like an artist doesn't care about us, then why should we care about them? And and it was in reference to the idea of people not paying for music or feeling like they shouldn't have to pay for music anymore, just that growing sentiment that's out there. How do you get your fans to care about you so they're willing to pay for music, they're willing to follow you for the long haul? You care about them, and you show them that you care about them. I mean, relationships are mutual encounters, and if you're treating your audience as um, wallets that hopefully will spend some of their content on you, then you're not treating them as human beings. Um, So I think that, like I was saying earlier, giving people ways to to exert their own creativity is really important. I think that um, one thing that I like a lot is, for example, Wilco, who have a um, taping policy on their front page of their website. Here's our policy for if you want to tape our shows, it's okay Hmm. with us, here's how to do it. Oh, wow. Um, And then Wilco turn around and they say to their fans in a letter, they say, you know, guys, we've been really nice to you, and now we've got a favor to ask. And they actually mentioned in this letter they sent out, this was before Sky Blue Sky came out, I think that's what the record is called, before it came out, they said, you know, we have let you tape our shows, we've done this, we've done that, and we have a favor to ask, which is the record's coming out on Tuesday, and if you guys all go buy it on Tuesday, then we'll chart. And that would be really important to us if we could chart. Um, And people did it. Mm -hmm. You know, they went on Tuesday. And how many of those people would have waited a week or two or three, except for that Wilco sent them an email and said, will you please do this for us? Uh Um, So I think that um, giving people information, being human for them rather than being all about image helps. Um, I think it's I think it's a challenge because for so long being a rock star has been about having mystique and, and not having to really um, show your cards to your audience in a personal kind of a way. And now people, I think, have come to sort of expect a personal connection with musicians. Well. I know that uh, some artists, because we on our podcast we've been talking a lot about Twitter, and mm-hmm. uh, some people have come back saying, "I don't want people to know everything about me." And right, and, and they're right. How how is there different approaches, and and how do you decide which which approach is best for uh, your music and your career, and and the type of people that follow you? Well, yeah, I mean, it's a great question, and I think it's it's true. Even the most ardent fan doesn't really want to know what you had for breakfast and that you've got a little tummy upset right now and that, oh, I'm so hungover, (laughs) unless you're singing about food and drinking, you know, and then maybe it's interesting. So I always think that it has a lot to do with being consistent with the persona that you're creating, Mm -hmm. right? So if you're a party hard kind of a persona, then tell us about how you're partying hard. But if you're a... um, party hard kind of a persona, then don't tell us about how you're having a cup of warm milk and calling it an early night. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I think it has to do with being consistent, and it also has to do with being with being genuine. You know, I mean, Twitter, you get the illusion that people are sharing everything, but there's a ton of stuff people don't share on Twitter. Even the most ardent Twitterers are really not Twittering everything. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, if, if people are Twittering everything, then apparently nobody has sex, because nobody ever reports their sex life on Twitter, as far as I can tell. <laughs> Um, so I, I think you do have to be judicious about what you share and what you don't and how much you share. Um, and again, that goes back to this is true in our personal relationships also, right? We don't tell people every single thing, even if they're good friends. There's mm-hmm. stuff that we go, you know, they're not going to be interested in that. So some of it is having having a sense of that. I think one of the challenges of things like Twitter is that people are following you for a variety of different reasons. And so it's hard to know what it is that they're getting out of your messages and which ones are appealing to them and which ones aren't. Um, So I think you really just sort of have to think of it as an extension of, um, in a way, sort of the banter between songs Mm -hmm. on stage. You're talking to your audience. What do do you want them to know? Mm -hmm. Do you think it's important for people through their uh, Twitter and blog and Facebook efforts to to have more of a defined purpose of why they communicate or is it, uh, you know, it's the internet and just share whatever you feel like sharing within that persona or, or do you think you should have more of a target in mind? Oh, that's a good question. And it's, 
I think it is good to have some sense of of what is the kind of message or messages that I want to convey to people here. Um, but there's so many different styles, you know, and I'm sort of loath to say that you ought to do this and you shouldn't do that because if you look at the musicians who are Twittering or the celebrities who are Twittering, they're doing all kinds of different things and building followings doing all kinds of different mm-hmm. things. So like you got Imogene Heap following back everybody who follows her and then you've got Dave Matthews not following hardly anybody who mm-hmm. follows him. And, I, you know, Dave Matthews' feed is full of all kinds of things that for me are a real turnoff. But he's got tons and tons of followers, so apparently they don't mind if he's twittering about what his farts smell like. <laughs> if it works for them. Yeah. You know, I don't. I don't listen to him. Maybe if yeah. I did, I would find that interesting. But. Yeah. So I mean, the the one thing I guess that uh, the way the quick communication allows for you to make quick adjustments too. If something's working, you can make an adjustment to keep doing that. If not, you can change quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, most of our listening audience, you know, they're the DIY indie artists that a lot of them have lots of other things going on in their lives, you know, jobs and things. And I know they ask us a lot, how is it possible to, you know, build an audience online when I've got all these things going on, um, you know, plus trying to make music? Uh, right. How is it possible for an artist like that to build a, a fan base online without having to spend all day on all the social networks and, and you know, detract from their music making? Is, is it possible for them to generate some good momentum on, online just through fans that way? Yeah, it's a it's a real problem, and I, I'm really sympathetic to that concern because there is sort of this expectation that indie musicians ought to be online all the time building their fan base, and I don't think that's a reasonable thing to ask of them, and I also don't really think it's a reasonable thing to expect them to be really good at that. Mm-hmm. Um, new technologies are hard, and the learning curve is is can be kind of steep if you're not you know, some people are really techy and, and it's easy for them and other people it's a challenge to sort of, what is this Twitter thing? How does it work? How do I get an account? What, uh, um, and I, I can't blame them for that. But I think that if you can get set up so that um, you're making things available for fans to take away from your own homepage, um, if you've got your music up on different places like MySpace and Last FM and Spotify and these other um, streaming services, if you've made your music available on places that make it possible to port it away, um, and if you are slapping a video up on YouTube now and then, and you're, I mean, Twitter takes no time. That's the beauty of Twitter, right? You can Twitter from your mobile phone while you're stopping at a red light. I know, no, I don't want to advocate Twittering while driving. <laughs> if you're in the passenger seat, stop at a Nancy, red light. Nancy, are you the one swerving all over the road, <laughs> Twittering? <laughs> I don't actually Twitter from my, well, I Twitter from my iPod. It doesn't count, but yeah. I don't have Wi-Fi in the car. Um, yeah, I mean, Twitter takes very little time. And, and one of the nice things about the, the web right now is that a lot of these things integrate with one another. So you can update your homepage if you've got your Twitter window in your homepage just by signing a Twitter, right? And now you've got some updated content on your webpage all the time. For people who aren't going to go to Twitter, they can go to your webpage and you can have a YouTube playlist of your music. And it takes some time to get these things set up, but it doesn't really necessarily take that long to maintain them. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to be on there. You don't have to be like Demi Moore on there. 24-7 24-7 twittering about every single thing you and Ashton are doing. <laughs> Please don't. <laughs> <laughs> oh, are, there, are there specific things that you think the average artist misses about the whole idea of fans and developing fans, just their approach and, and what a fan is looking for? I think that it's sometimes not fully understood the extent to which part of being a fan is showing who I am to my friends and mm-hmm. that if you give me good ways to show them that I'm your fan, then I'm going to be motivated to do that. Mm-hmm. Right. So this is why we wear t-shirts because we want people to see that I'm a so-and-so fan. Mm-hmm. Right. And I've been to shows where I really wanted to buy a t-shirt cause I really wanted to have a t-shirt with that band's name, but the t-shirts were ugly. <laughs> 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 right. Yeah. And so, you know, if you can give people, things that they can take with them elsewhere on the internet and face-to-face, they're going to want to do that. Not all of them, but enough of them. And I think that 
I think sometimes bands underestimate the extent to which you have to... Uh, let me see how I can say this. Fans, bands sometimes feel like you have to get everybody to come to your site mm-hmm. and become your friend on MySpace or be a fan on your Facebook page or, or whatever. And that's part of it, but it's also really important to, to give fans things that they can take to their own sites and go where they are. You can't be every place that you ought to be because there's just so many sites, especially if you're looking internationally. Mm-hmm. There's so many networking sites that are being used around the globe, and you can't go to create a profile on every single one of them, or you are going to be doing that full-time, and you're not going to be writing any music. Um, but if you have a few sites where you're represented, and those are sites that have the quality that things from them can be embedded by users in other places, whether that's a YouTube playlist or a Last.fm playlist or a Reverb Nation widget, if you have those kinds of materials in those places that you are, then fans can take them with them to wherever the fans go. Mm-hmm. And the other side of that is to, I, I would encourage people to think about how they can incorporate content that fans generate into their own websites. So, for example, I was pretty impressed recently when I was looking at Franz Ferdinand's website, and they've got a photo section uh, where the fans submit the pictures that they've taken of the band. Hmm. So they have a continuous stream of new pictures coming in, but they don't have to hire photographers, and they don't have to... Um, go out and find these things, the fans are sending them in. Mm-hmm. Um, and that is, they both get new content for the website all the time, and people want to go to the website to see the new pictures. Plus, they're showing the fans, we respect you, we like your creativity, we want you to be part of the Franz Ferdinand message, um, and all those relationship-building benefits of it. One thing I heard you mention um, in your presentation at Madame was that uh, something about how the managers and all the people behind the scenes that the fans don't care about you one bit. And sometimes <laughs> those people think it's all about them. And uh, I think that's also an important perspective to maintain as well, that, uh, you know, the, it's good to have a, a quality crew behind the scenes working for you if you can afford it, but it's still not about them. It's about giving the fans what they need. Right. I mean, the ideal manager, the ideal record label, well, I don't want to say that with the labels, because I think with independent labels, sometimes they are that, um, they're what they're supposed to be, you know, they're the, ooh, I trust them, and they've got a new band, I'll go check that band out, Mm -hmm. you know, so I think with some indie labels, the label itself matters, Um, although I still think that even in those cases, you know, what Saddle Creek fans can name the person or the people behind Saddle Creek and do they care what they had for breakfast? Probably not. Yeah. You know? But I think really good managers ought to basically be invisible. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, before we close out the podcast, you have uh, four basic principles that you've come up with to help fans and artists and to, to create a better fan community. Can you hit those for us? Sure. Um, I think one thing that's really important is that um, artists try to make personal connections with fans. And and I want to emphasize that that doesn't mean that you have to actually have one-on-one communication with every single fan that you've got, Um, although for some artists that might work. But but treat them as individuals and and be an individual yourself and and allow them allow there to be a bit of getting to know one another that occurs and the other side of that is to foster the connections that they have with each other mm-hmm. um it's also i think important for like i was saying earlier for musicians to pick a few social networking sites that they can commit to keeping up and and being there. It's it's important not to go create a site everywhere and then not be around to maintain it. So pick a few sites that work for you, whether that's Twitter or MySpace or Facebook or Bebo or whatever. Um, Find a few sites where you can really sustain a presence and commit to sustaining that presence there. Um, Like I was talking about, give fans some tools to take your word around elsewhere. They want to tell their friends what a great song it is, and they want their friends to be able to click and listen, so give them that code that allows them to do that. Um, And then the last point is for fans to be able to be creative. I think frequently artists feel like this is my property, and I don't want fans to do anything with it. Um, But fans, especially creative ones, they want to design t-shirts, they want to remix songs, they want to write stories about you, and um, give them a venue to do that, um, or at least at the very, very least, don't try to knock them down when they do do that. 
Uh, that's good advice. I know you've got your blog, which is onlinefandom.com. Is there any other places our listeners can uh, read uh, about what you're up to? Um, well, you know, if you go to that blog and you click over on the right side, there is a, a, a link that says Longer Writings, and I do have some longer papers there that get at some of these things. Um, and you can find me on Twitter where I'm Nancy Bain, but be warned, you know, you'll have to learn about my kids and stuff in addition to my thoughts about music. All right, well, I'll be following you then. <laughs> All right, follow you back. All right, well, thanks for being on the podcast, Nancy. Pleasure. Well, that's going to do it for this edition of the podcast. Again, Nancy's blog is onlinefandom.com. So if you want to dig in and read a little more, I encourage you to check it out. If you'd like to weigh in on the topics covered in this podcast or previous episodes, there are several ways in which you can do so. One is our listener line at 206-426-5683, or you can email us at info at cdbabypodcast.com, or you can leave a comment in the show notes for this episode, which is found at cdbabypodcast.com. Also, if you've been enjoying the podcast, there are a couple ways in which you can help us out and support the show. First of all, you can tell your artist friends. That would be nice. Secondly, you can leave some positive feedback on the podcast page in iTunes. Many of you have done that already, and we thank you for that. And uh, lastly, you can purchase your very own CD Baby Podcast t-shirt. They're very nice shirts uh, with a cool design, which I know you will enjoy for years and years to come. The reason that I I mention it is that the more support we get from you, the artist community, the more we are able to allocate resources to bring you these podcasts. And there are still many topics and conversations to be had, so um, your support's appreciated. Well, that's all for now. We'll catch you next time. been listening to the CD Baby DIY Musician Podcast, broadcasting from Portland, Oregon, USA. 